So tonight we're gonna to be doing discussions in neuroophthalmic disease. This is the start of the program, uh, discussions in neuroophthalmic disease, rules, exceptions to the rules and exceptions to the exception to the rules. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with Joe. Uh, Joe is a colleague of ours, as everyone knows. Joe is uh, well written. Joe has launched many uh, 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 societies within optometry. He's uh, been involved with the Optometric Glaucoma Society. He's uh, the chairman of the neuroophthalmic uh, section uh, at the Academy. He helped with uh, the retina section. And then on top of that, Joe is a very gifted writer. I have learned that because I've written an article, thought it sounded great, literally sent it to Joe. He sent it back in about a half hour. I said, oh, great. He must not have changed it too much. And uh, he changed it and made it even uh, very, and it made it even nicer. So gifted writer, you probably know that Joe uh, is the, the lead author of the Review of Optometry, the Disease Handbook. Uh, recent, you know, Joe was with uh, Nova uh, School of Optometry for about 28 and a half years. And Joe recently is now working uh, in Sarasota. So we talked about Joe being a gifted uh, writer. Now you're going to find out that he's a gifted uh, speaker and how he can bring neuro disease and, and make it manageable for all of us. So Joe, it's great working with you. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, we're going to be talking about discussions in neuro-ophthalmic disease. What I call rules, exceptions to the rules, and exceptions to the exceptions to the rules. And as Greg said, I was formerly at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years and two days. I am now a provider at Center for Sight uh, under the umbrella of USI, which is a large medical surgical group on the west coast of Florida. Now, I am or have been a consultant or on the Speakers Bureau or the Advisory Board for Novartis, Allergan, Glaco, Spousal Loam, Airy, and Ocular Therapeutics. We've got no financial interest in any, any products that we may possibly discuss, but with Greg, I am a co-owner of Optometric Education uh, Consultants. Now, everybody has philosophies about neuroophthalmic disease. Thurston Howell III doesn't like neuro. Neuro equals referral and diagnose and adios. Now I know probably half the audience don't, you know, don't recognize this, this, uh, this character, the illusion. It's from a TV show uh, several many years ago called Gilligan's Island. And uh, I actually had a chance on, on like me TV. Uh, it was in the background one time when I was cooking dinner not that long ago. And I actually paid a little bit of attention to it. I realized just how bad that show really was. I mean, it was actually terrible. But we all have to have philosophies about neuroophthalmic disease. Some people don't like it because patients have, uh, have a nasty habit of getting very sick, going blind, and sometimes dying. And it usually involves us uh, tapping back into something that many of us struggled with uh, in optometry school, and that was neuroanatomy class. Well, we all have various philosophies. You know, managing patients with neuroophthalmic disease, you have to have an understanding of the anatomy, at least basically, we all learned in optometry school. And we have to follow a few fundamental principles and a few simple rules. And this is about rules, and I'm gonna give you a lot of the rules that I think you, will help you out. It's good to have a network of referral physicians, including a neuroradiologist, but that's not always possible. A neurologist, a good internist is worth his or her weight in gold. I work with them all the time. A neurosurgeon and somebody who does more than back surgery is sometimes hopefully a neuroradiologist. Now, why, why should we even bother with this or get involved with it? Well, neuroophthalmic disease is, is prime for optometry. There's virtually no therapeutics involved. You know, so it doesn't really matter where, where your, what, your, what your state license involves. In fact, whenever I, whenever I lecture in other countries, I usually talk about neuroophthalmic disease because again, no drugs or, or, or maybe one drug, prednisone, very, very few. It's all about making the proper diagnosis. Now, neuro-ophthalmologists clinically are, are becoming few and far between. It is a declining specialty. In fact, they're trying to beef it up, up, beef it up now with orbital surgery. But there are not a lot of clinical neuro-ophthalmologists in North America. There's about 250. 
the NANOS, North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society, only boasts about 400 mem members across uh, North America. And not all of them, you know, some are scientists, not are, not are clinicians. So they, they recognize they need help. And NANOS has actually been reaching out to optometry. And they want to get us involved. And, you know, they, they've embraced osteopathic physicians. They've embraced neurologists. They want to now embrace neuro, uh, optometrists because they need boots on the ground. They need help. And there's a lot of stuff that we can handle in terms of bread and butter neuro-ophthalmology. And if we can do that, that frees up the neuro-ophthalmologists for doing the things that are a bit more complicated. Now, my philosophy has always been if you follow a couple simple rules and fundamental principles, you'll be able to handle 90% of the neuroophthalmic disease that comes into your office. Now, in an hour and 40 minutes, I'm not going to impart on anybody the equivalent of a neuroophthalmology fellowship. But what I can do is give you some information that's simple that you can apply. And will at least one thing I'm hoping will keep keep get somebody out of trouble clinically tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to share a personal case to prove my point. My point is, my philosophy is if you know the fundamentals and a few simple rules, you can handle 90% of the, of the neuro op that comes into your practice. Now, the patient is my mother-in-law. Now, my mother-in-law is, is a very, very interesting, very interesting person, very fascinating woman. She's very dramatic. If, if drama doesn't exist, it will be created, it will be nurtured like a hothouse orchid, and it will be developed. Now, years ago, my mother-in-law, for lack of a better term, screwed up LASIK surgery. And, you know, she's not a doctor. Right? She's a patient. How do you screw up LASIK surgery as a patient? You only have to do two things. Take a Valium and sit still. That's one two things you have to do. But my mother-in-law does believe she's, she's different than other people. When I say different, I mean fundamentally and biochemically different. She believes anesthetic doesn't work, anesthesia doesn't work on her like a normal person. So this was the time they actually used microkeratomes to slice the cornea. And when they were making the microkeratome cut across her cornea, she decided that the lid speculum holding her eyelid open was so distasteful, she forcefully, intentionally blepharospasmed and popped it off. Got caught. I mean, it, it actually, the microkeratome got caught halfway across the cornea. They had to inch it back out, heal the cornea, bring her back six weeks later, redo the procedure, which they did successfully that time. I think that I think they get used more anesthesia. I think they used general at that point. And uh, she ended up with some regular stigmatism, probably one of the greatest days of her life. She can she has something to complain about. Okay. Now fast forward. I'm going down to Australia to lecture. My wife who's an optometrist is coming with me. And she makes an arrangement for my mother-in-law to house it. I'm very happy about that. Watch the house while we're gone for two weeks, take care of the animals, all perfect. And she was complaining about her vision. This was sometime much later after the refractive surgery issue. And uh, my wife made a, an arrangement for her to go to our university clinic for an eye exam. So we're in Australia doing, doing my gig, trying to enjoy ourselves. And, uh, and, and my, my mother-in-law goes to the, our clinic and they can't refract her in that one eye to 2020, which they felt they should. So they didn't really have an explanation. Now, you have to have an explanation for the eye not correctable in 2020, right? That's one of the rules. And there are things you can do. You can do an OCT, you can do color vision, you can check pupils, you can do a contact lens over, RGP over. There are a number of things that you could do. Now, by the way, my mother-in-law did not share the history about refra the refractive mishap. Don't know why, but she didn't. So one of the things that sometimes people will do when an eye is not correctable in 2020 is they'll do a visual field. So they do a visual field, and the next, the next morning we wake up and there's an email from my wife, from our colleague saying that she came in, her, you know, your mother came in, she didn't have uh, a correctable 2020 eye. They did a visual field, and it appears as though there's a bitemporal defect. 
gosh. So my wife is now frantic that her mother has a, a pituitary or uh, adenoma or cranial pharyngioma or some sort of compressed compression on her chiasm. And I'm trying to, I'm reading the email, I'm trying to read between the lines, I'm telling, I'm telling my, my wife or trying to explain to her, you know, it's not really, I'm not saying she has a brain tumor, I'm saying it appears as though she has a bitemporal defect. Okay, it appear, I'm trying to explain this to her and I said, that doesn't mean that she, she has a brain tumor. And at this point, my, my wife is getting angry with me. And the reason she's getting angry with me is she feels I'm underreacting. Like I'm not taking it seriously now. Personally, I think uh, I think it's a good thing to have a spouse that maintains calm. But apparently, that that isn't uh, that isn't a, a characteristic that is, is deemed uh, deemed very highly. Don't get me wrong. I love my mother-in-law. I don't want to see anything bad happen to her. You know, for the most part. So uh, I'm trying to explain to her that, you know, the way this sounds, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not enthralled by this. And, but of course, they didn't send the visual field. And being across the date line, it's not easy to, to communicate. So it took another day for them to get the visual field in. And the visual field comes the next day, and it looks like that. And I'm looking at it, and I see their point. It is bilateral. It is temporal in each eye. Okay, I, I get it. It's it's by I see it's bitemporal, but it is not that classic bitemporal visual field. It's not that textbook field that you're gonna see with chiasmal compression. But of course, I think we all realize textbook fields are usually only found in textbooks. But the thing to always remember about chiasmal compression, be it from below or up above a, an adenoma or a cranial pharyngioma, it's going to start and go one direction. If something, if something is, if a pituitary is expanding and compressing the chiasm from below, it's going to start here and go that direction. If it's cranial pharyngioma, it's going to start here and go this direction. It's not going to go both directions. And that's very, very important. And I look at this and the first thing that I see here is an enlarged blind spot. Now, what causes enlarged blind spots? Papilledema, dystrusin, high myopia, congenital colobomas, morning glory, tilted disc syndrome. There are a number of things, the majority of which are all you know, pretty well benign. So I asked my wife, does your mother have an anomalous nerve? Does she have a funny looking nerve? She can't, she can't say, she can't, she can't tell me one way or the other. Okay. So we get back and we get her into the, uh, we get her into the clinic and I get a chance to see her. And this is what, what, what I find. Okay. She has anomalous nerves. There is clearly a tilted disc syndrome. There's a large scleral onlage. There's your enlarged blind spot. There it is. There, there's your quote unquote bitemporal defect, which really was enlarged blind spot. I, I mean, I, I recognize that this was like the issue when I was still in Australia before I even came home and saw her. Okay. Well, I'm not out of the woods yet. See her, you know, she, she has a relation who's an ophthalmologist. So she goes in to, to see, and he's a retinal specialist very good retinal specialist. And he go, she goes in to see him and he sees optic disc atrophy, disc pallor. Now, those nerves are not pale. The scleral tissue around it is pale, but they're not pale. And of course he wants to do an MRI. Well, I, you know, I explain everything to everybody now you know, when you say, what's, what's the harm? Well, you know, my, at that time, my mother-in-law had pre-Obamacare insurance, really bad, just designed to keep her alive in the in event of a catastrophe with a very high deductible. So if anybody's going to be paying for it, it's this guy right here. And I don't mind doing it if she needs it. I know she doesn't need it. So I explain everything to everybody and get everybody to stand down and relax and everything's good. So I thought. Then, I don't know what happened. I lost focus. I looked the other way. I probably went away to a conference. She goes back for a follow-up, and now they diagnose a new onset afferent defect. Well, was my wife right? Was I, was I being cavalier? Was I not uh, taking this seriously enough? Well, 
think about it, he's a retinal specialist, bu bu busy practice. When does he see the patient? When they're dilated. He's not going to be making a diagnosis of a relative afferent defect in a dilated eye. Likely that's a technician. And probably not, and probably not a, a, a skilled technician. So before I knew it, she was in the tube. And the MRI came back as normal. Not wanting to be mistaken or missing anything, he refers her to a neuro-ophthalmologist on the university level. And my mother-in-law went, and if, you, and if you can believe the, the account uh, of the exam, and that's a, a mighty big if, he checked her pupils, did a confrontation field, looked at the MRI findings, did a direct ophthalmoscopy, looked at it and said, what's wrong with you? You're normal. You're wasting everybody's time. Go home. Get out of here. This all took four months. For what I knew when I was still in Australia, that this was a large blind spot from funny looking nerves. Now, you'd think I'd be out of the woods, not quite there yet, not quite out of the woods, still, still suffering a little bit here. My wife is still needling me. Now, my wife is only, is the only doctor I know who will refer a patient to me for a consultation. And when I give her my opinion, she goes, are you sure? So. She keeps asking me, because it's my mother, are you sure it's the, she doesn't have a brain tumor? I said, yes, I know she, she doesn't have, are you sure she doesn't have a brain tumor? I said, yes. It's well known, tilted disc syndrome can give a pseudo bitemporal field defect. And I actually pulled up some, a, a manuscript and I said, here, it's in the peer review literature. Bitemporal visual field defects mimicking chiasmal compression in eyes with tilted disc syndrome. You don't have to just take my word for it. It's been published. Need a diet Mountain Dew. Thank you. Okay. Oh. You're just tired. You slept a lot. Well, I, I, people need it. Need a mute. Okay. Thank you, Greg. I got it. All right. So, Joe, while there's a break right there, just everyone knows the handout has been launched twice, and sent to our listener all the way over in Japan. We have someone listening from Japan tonight. So, thank you for your service. I think I think they're listening tomorrow, Greg. In Japan. I just uh, got the email to send the handout. I think they're listening not tonight, but they're listening in tomorrow in, in Japan. She's so, in the chat box, Joe. We're not even going to talk about this ever again. I know there's friends out, friends out there. Grace, I know you're out there. Hi, Grace. Hi, Bill. Hi, Colette. You're not going to say anything to my wife because she doesn't like it when I tell this story because she's going to kill me if she finds out I told the story again. So we're all going to keep it as our little secret. So here's a rule. Congenital optic nerve anomalies can have sometimes dramatic visual field loss. And the challenge is sometimes when it looks like glaucoma or somebody is suspected of having glaucoma, and they've got a congenital disc anomaly. You have to wonder, is the field loss acquired or has it been there? And it's extremely hard to figure out. Here's an example of a, a case I helped out one of my res residents not that long ago. 41 year old male who's got a little blur at distance, correctable at 2020 20 HI with uh, myopic correction, but had uh, constricted confrontation fields. And if you get a slightly constricted confrontation field, you know it's bad. Pupils were normal, pressures were normal, questionable pal with very small cups. Now he did have an MRI several years ago, but he couldn't remember why he had an MRI of the brain. He thinks maybe it was for headache. And he looks like this and we, we have some some elevation to the nerves and almost look like a like a waxiness or or even a yellowness uh, as opposed to a pinkness or a, a whiteness and you can actually see on the on the on the superficial aspect what looks to be disc drusen and when we take a look at it we can see there are abnormalities on the uh, on the OCT nerve fiber layer there's abnormalities, particularly in the in the right ganglion cell complex in this eye. And this is a pretty, uh, pretty explicable for disc drusen. There's virtually, I mean, there's no cup that's been measured by the OCT. And we take a look, we can see that there's really been no spread uh, of edema beyond the optic nerve. We can actually see right there cutting through a very, very superficially exposed optic disc drusen. And we take a look and this is a 30-2 and he had some significant constriction. And is this explicable by disc drusen? The answer is absolutely yes. 
But what I do want to point out, and I think it's uh, it's worth noting, is looking at the uh, congruity of that field defect. You know, and it, a right uh, inferior quadrant defect. I mean, it does go all it does you know, it kind of crosses over here, but I can't look at that and and ignore it. Now, fundus autofluorescent, I, I didn't do a B scan. I did do, and I had really classic hyperfractile nerve spikes of Drusen. But uh, you know, what about an MRI? And I've got a reason for the to, for for the fields to look like that. But it just has too much congruity, and this is exactly the type of person I'm going to neuroimage. And we did, and I I made an explanation to the patient that we may turn up nothing and that's what we want. We want to turn up nothing and we turned up nothing. Everything was good. We did our fiduciary duty. Now, can you treat this? Uh, do you treat this? The answer is no. You know, if a patient had elevated intraocular pressure, it's generally the, the, the thought in the literature is, yeah, you can use glaucoma medicines, but there is no proof that has ever been published Then it benefits at all. And forget alpha again. Don't put alpha again. Alpha again is not neuroprotectin. That was, you know, that was a broad leap of faith that we that has been embraced by many based upon bad research and bad data. Alpha again, not neuroprotective. Come so on, answer, one more one more decade, Joe. We might be neuroprotective. That started in two thousand. Maybe one yeah, more decade. Maybe, <laughs> maybe by the time we're, we we retire. You know, don't make diagnoses of immune disease in, in immunosuppressed patients. You know, patients on uh, on cancer chemotherapy are not going to be having uh, uveitic disease. They're going to have perineoplastic syndromes. Now, this what I miss about uh, doing these live in person. Hi, Angela. Is uh, I don't get to interact. And this would be the audience participation part of the program. And this is exactly where um, people would start looking away. Now, Greg, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you as my audience, okay? Are you with me? I'm here. All right. What Greg and I are going to do, and we've not rehearsed this, <laughs> boy, we don't rehearse these, uh, is we're going to write a question. Greg's going to write a question, and we're going to come up with an answer. So, Greg, Give me any age and any sex you want. Um, 52 year old uh, woman. All right, 52 year, year old woman uh, with a previous history of cancer presents with, give me any neuroptomic finding that you want. Um, numbness in her fingers. Numbness in her fingers, all right. She also complains of, give me any symptom you want. Um, Dry eye and um, uh, and headaches every so often. Okay. Initially, additionally, you note. Give me any medical finding you want. Um, she's diabetic. Okay. So a 52-year-old female patient with a previous history of cancer presents with. I said neuroptam. You said numbness in the fingers. Let's make it oh, double sorry. vision. Let's make All it right, double vision. vision. I I missed the narrow. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Double vision. Also complains of numbness in her fingers and headache. Additionally, you note what you said, diabetes? Diabetes. Okay. So we just made up a question. What's the most likely cause? Is it cancer? Is it cancer? Is it cancer? Or is it cancer? Or all the above? Greg, what do you think it is? Uh, I'm going to go with all the above. It is all the above. Never diagnose ischemic or idiopathic anything in a patient with a history of cancer. It's always cancer until proven otherwise when you have a neuroptomic finding. Now, granted, there is a big difference between a woman treated with a mastectomy 25 years ago and a man treated with prostate cancer last year. But it's always cancer until proven otherwise. You know, in, you know, Greg, you did you did fine. I actually pulled this uh, on a mate of mine in Australia live. And he, he was my plant in the audience, the front row. This is, this person was the president of Optometry Australia, which is the equivalent of the our AOA president. You know, he had a radio show. He had the gift of gab. I put the microphone in front of him. He froze like a wallaby in the headlights. It was painful. It was like, it, it was excruciating. And finally, I said, give me any medical finding at all. And he, st he stammers and he humps and he gives uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> you noticed that, didn't you? 
that was that was my other one I was going to use. You know, um, in my new practice, one of the first patients that I saw was an older man who came in with uh, with with double vision, some vertical, simple, isolated, double, you know, double vision, vertical double vision, and a fourth nerve palsy. But the kicker was he was on maintenance chemotherapy from lung cancer. And, you know, he had, he had been through treatment and he was on a, a maintenance dose of chemotherapy periodically. And he also said, you know, doc, my, my gripper, my left gripper is not that, you know, I, I, it doesn't feel as strong. Okay. So now I got a paresthesia, a fourth nerve palsy uh, in a person who's got a history of cancer and relatively recent cancer. And this is exactly the kind of situation that makes me, makes me, I say uncomfortable. It gives me a bad feeling. I have probably neuroimaged one fourth nerve palsy in my entire career, and this was it. I saw him on a Thursday. By by Monday, he was going to hospice. He had metastatic brain cancer. Greg, brings me polling question number one. It is launched. Which of the following is a neuroptomic emergency? Acute painful double vision, acute painful vision loss, acute painful ptosis, acute painful painful pupil dilation, or acute painful pupil meiosis. And a reminder, everyone, while you're doing that, is that their handout is uh, is in the 645 email. You'll get it after the, in the two emails, one tonight, one tomorrow. And it's also in the chat box. And I can relaunch it again if you didn't get it out of the chat box. Just send send a message. And those Florida licensees taking the TQ, you will need the, the, the handout to answer the questions. I'm happy to say that every so far who has taken our TQ online have passed. So this one seems a little bit on the challenging side, Greg. We're, we're coming in. We're coming in slowly. Yep. Let's get this up. Everyone out there, please reply, make it live and interactive. Cameras are on. I'm seeing that. I'll get a report from Vanessa here shortly. This is the other part of live and interactive CE that's out there. So what is a neuroptomic emergency? Acute painful double vision, vision loss, ptosis, pupil dilation, and pupil meiosis. Okay. Good splitting they're, here. They're, roll, they're rolling in. There, there we go. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. 93%. Perfect. So we All right, good? Jay, I think, think we're good. And I'm going to right. share the results so everyone right. can see here by a narrow margin. Pupil dilation, painful vision loss, double vision, ptosis and meiosis were kind of low, low down there. Okay. Fill in the blank. Acute painful blank is a neuroptomic emergency. The answer is anything. Acute painful anything is a neuroptomic emergency. Acute painful vision loss, temporal arteritis. Acute painful double vision, third nerve palsy. Acute painful uh, to ptosis, third nerve palsy. Acute painful dilate, dilated uh, pupil, third nerve palsy. Acute painful um, pupil meiosis. Corner cinema carotid dissection. They're all acute painful neuroophthalmic anything is an emergency. I'm going to go right into polling question number two, Greg. A 50 year old man wakes up three months ago with count fingers vision in his right eye and comes in now. How long do you have to figure out what is wrong with this person? One hour? One day? two days or three months. Count fingers vision suddenly woke up count fingers vision three months ago. Now he's coming to see you. How long do you ever figure this out? An hour, a day, by tomorrow or three months. Joe, as they're answering it, you'll like this comment, a uh, little private chat here back and forth, but it says, ha ha, I love Dr. Salkow's lecture. Makes me reminisce about the great days at Nova. Uh, and who did, and who, and you can tell me who that was? First name only? No, it, uh, first name is Stephanie. I know Stephanie. 
I saw her come in. All right, Greg, we're almost to 90%. Okay, and let me share it. 20% said an hour, 22% said a day, 12% said two days, and 45% said three months. Here's a rule, urgency of evaluation is dictated by duration of condition. How long it's been there is how long you have to figure out. Now, the title is rules and exceptions to the rules. There's always an exception to the exception to the rules. But generally speaking, however long it's been there is how long you have to figure it out. Sudden vision loss of two hours, you got two hours to figure it out. Double vision of a week, you had a week to figure it out. Sudden vision loss of, of, of three months, you got three months to figure out. Something's been there for you know 10 years, you know, go home, you bother me, you're normal. However long it's been there is how long you got. You don't have to figure out everything at the time of the patient's appointment. Sometimes you got to take a breather and think it through, but understand how long you have generally. He's a 46 year old male who woke up three months ago not being able to see on his right eye. He's light perception 2020. He has disc panel in the right eye, no other findings. He has no known medical history. Uh, he's never, he hasn't had a medical exam in a very long time. He's that terrible demographic of middle aged male not getting health care. He sees one of my residents and, and she got nervous. She didn't call me, she didn't text me. She was in a, I was in another facility. She panics and sends us to the ER. And I can tell you at the ER, they're gonna do a CAT scan because that's what they do. And if there's no intracranial bleed, they let them go. How long do we have to get this to work up? Three months. It's been there for three months. You know, how much worse is it gonna get? Light perception minus two? I mean, we, we, how, you, you got time in a situation like that, don't panic. If I can tell you anything tonight, take home, however long it's been there is generally how long you have to figure it out for the most part. So there's uh, a comment in the yes. uh, chat box. It said, mm -hmm. look at scar, I guess, para just, you know, down there, I guess, inferior nasal there. I think mm -hmm. I saw it to the optic nerve head. Yep. So just a comment. Could be a scar, could be RP hypertrophy. I mean, if, if it's a scar tissue, we might say that it is toxoplasmosis. I mean, that'd be a first thought. Could this be a, 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 a post infectious neuropathy? Yeah. How long do we have to figure, you know, how long do we have to get the titers? We've got three months, it's not going anywhere. Now this is all about rules. We have to obey the rules. She's a 57 year old female who's a low risk ocular hypertension, somewhere in the low twenties who got sent in to me for an evaluation in the glaucoma service. Now her OCT, optic nerve, everything was perfectly normal. This is what she looked like. So you got a woman who's got 24 or 25 pressure, average pachymetry, and we take a look, and fairly large nerves with large cups of probably a, a seven or so, six five to seven five, somewhere in there. No pallor, everything uh, is, is symmetrical. There's no notching in the neuroretinal rim. We take a look at the, uh, at the nerve fiber layer and what do we see? We see a, a healthy and robust uh, OCT on the serous. Everything falls within the normal data range. And this is one of those situations, you know, I saw her pressures, gonioscopy, pachymetry, disc photos, visit one. I was pretty happy with it brought her back for another pressure reading and an OCT, I was pretty happy with it. I was just about to dismiss her, but I acknowledge she is an ocular hypertensive. And we should have a good baseline. So I brought her back one more time for one more pressure and a field and the fields were a little bit unexpected. And this is what she looked like. And then we have to ask, where is that lesion? Now, the fact that this is vertical we can see those, I mean, these are all zeros. These are all less than zeros, right down, all right? It's respecting the vertical. When it respects the vertical, we have to consider this as neurologic. Now, of course, what we want to do is see what is happening in the other eye, because we can't tell from here, because if something is chiasmal or retrochiasmal, it's going to be represented in the other eye as well. And there's her other eye. somewhat confounding and not what we expect to see. So is it is it a neurologic event? Well, that is vertical. I mean, these are all less than zeros. It's perfectly respecting the, the vertical hemianopic line. 
but it's only in one eye. So that would lead one to think that this has to be anterior visual pathway. I would agree. Field loss in one eye would be anterior visual pathway. The problem being here, however, her vision's fine. We saw the optic nerves, they looked good. Her nerve fiber layer was good. Her color vision was fine and she had no pupil defect. Ergo, it can't be in the, uh, the anterior visual pathway, but it's gotta be somewhere. Now you may, people out there may be thinking, you know, where, where would you image this patient? And, you know, Greg, we do this again. We're gonna have to make that another polling question. Where do you, uh, where do you want to uh, image this patient? And it, another pearl to remember is the best neuroradiologist in the world can help you if you don't order the scan, order the right scan and tell them what to look for. Well, this shouldn't exist. Ergo, it doesn't. What do we do? Or well, the easiest thing, do we do a CT, CTA, MR, MRA? Where do we look? The answer is we march the patient back to the field unit and this is a repeat on the same day. Here's what happened. Work with students. This uh, woman, first time she ever ta had taken a visual field. Now the student who was running the field she chose some words rather than the, explain the test as we're going to test your right eye first. She said, we're going to test your right side first, meaning right side or right vision, right eye. Patient heard, you know, one or two times the student say right side. She was under the impression she should ignore everything on the left, which is what she did initially. So it shouldn't exist. Aragor doesn't repeat it and we figured it out. Chiasmal and retrochiasmal lesions have bilateral involvement virtually always. It may not be as symmetrical as you think it is, but usually it should be there. Unilateral field loss reflects anterior visual pathway disease, but it should show something that's identifiable to the visual acuity, to the nerve, the nerve fiber layer, the color visual system, or the afferent pupillary system. So here's a rule. A patient can fake a field but they can't fake a nerve fiber layer and they can't fake a pupil defect. Always, always remember that. He's a 59 year old male who came into our general care clinic at the university for a routine examination. He was assessed to having cup to disc ratio of 0.5 by 0.5 in each eye, pressure of 20. He was given a prescription for, for progressives and released. Comes back two years later, complaining a slowly progressive loss of vision in the right eye. At this point, he's got an afferent defect and 2080 acuity in the right eye, 2020 in the left. He has a superior altitudinal defect splitting fixation and some mild defects in the other eye. And he is seen to have disc pallor. And the clinicians who were working with the patient at the time said, you've had a stroke in the eye or presumptively a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. There's no treatment for it. There's nothing we can do. It just is. Now, you should be thinking to yourself, what else is wrong with it? What is wrong with this picture? There's actually four things wrong here that don't support a diagnosis of a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Superior altitudinal defect in the right eye, six to one, it's going to be an inferior defect. And you know, we all have heard altitudinal defects, not necessarily, they're mostly arcuate defects, very glaucoma-like. But six to one, and anatomically, we don't really know why, it's going to affect the inferior field. Also, there's field defects in the fellow eye. So there's bilateral involvement, which is not typical, of a non arteric ischemic neuropathy. Also, it's a slowly progressive loss of vision. non arteritic ischemic neuropathy is an abrupt loss of vision, which can get progressively worse over the course of several days to a week. And it can spontaneously improve by three or more lines of acuity at six months, but it's not a slowly progressive loss of vision. It's relatively abrupt. The most troubling thing is the assessed cup to disc ratio of a five by five. That just doesn't happen. Non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a disease where you have a small, crowded, 
choked nerve, what we call a disc at risk. 0.5 is just not really supportable that diagnosis. Now, I got a chance to see the patient. The pressure is 23. CD is actually 9.5 in the right eye and about an 8 in the left with very shallow cupping or what is known as saucerization. Essentially, what had happened was the optic nerve was misassessed. The patient had undiagnosed glaucoma two years ago. It, she wasn't treated, got, it progressed, lost fixation in the right eye. Don't make diagnoses of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in glaucoma patients. They don't come together. I have unfortunately seen a number of colleagues, both optometric and ophthalmologic, use non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy to explain disc pallor, even in a glaucoma patient, you know, as a way of using what I call a diagnosis of convenience. It's a great diagnosis of convenience. There's no test to diagnose it. And if you diagnose it, there's no treatment for it. So there's nothing you really need to do. So a lot of times people will, uh, will, will ascribe disc pallor to, to an old infarct or, or, or an old stroke of the nerve, me a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Glaucoma is a disease of cupping. Non-arteric ischemic neuropathy is a disease of non-cupping. That's a very important thing. 97% of non-arteric anterior ischemic optic neuropathy patients have a 0.2 or less CD ratio, and the other 3% are misdiagnosed. Diagnoses of exclusion should be your last diagnosis, not your first. Here's some, here's some terms that, that, we, that we come across. 80s tonic pupil, I, I see that diagnosed clinically. Well, 80s tonic pupil is a light near dissociated pupil, often a healthy young female with loss of deep tendon reflexes. Understand other things cause tonic pupils. Trauma, diabetes, zoster, giant cell arteritis, and you know, just call it 80s if the, if the other features are not there, and you don't consider other, other potential causes an error. Pseudotumor. You know, I, I, I have unfortunately known colleagues to look at a patient with bilateral disc edema. She's young, she's female, she's over her ideal weight, she's of childbearing age, and they start treating with Diamox without getting the, the appropriate uh, evaluation. Very, very dangerous. Bell's palsy, there are certain irritative lesions that can cause a facial paralysis. I've already talked about non arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Telosa Hunt syndrome. 100 years ago, a guy named Telosa and a guy named Hunt saw a couple patients with painful ophthalmoparesis. Their skull x rays, which is all they had at the time, were normal. Ergo, they had Telosa Hunt syndrome. The last case of presumptive Telosa Hunt syndrome that I, that I came across or was, was involved in in any manner was actually neurosarcoid. So these should be your, your last diagnoses, not your first diagnoses. This comes as a consult from a colleague and friend of mine. 48 year old male had painless loss of visual field in his left eye. He knows when he for, for, first woke up. I mean, he had a flu about a, a, about a month earlier, but that was just a red herring. His vision was still good, but he noticed there's something not right when he woke up. And by, by the end of the day, by midday, he realized there's something wrong, sought, sought, sought care, and had a nice inferior arc or a defect uh, in the left eye, full fields in the right. And what we see is a hyperemic swollen optic nerve with, with disc hemorrhages in the, uh, in the left eye and the right eye. This is all glial tissue. It's a small crowded cup. Uh, nerve with virtually no cup. And this is a clinical diagnosis of non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy with a classic disc at risk. Greg, that brings me to my polling question number three. What feature indicates something other than glaucoma? Is it a disc hemorrhage? Is it disc pallor? Is it notching in the rim tissue? Or is it parapapillary atrophy? Joe, when it comes to time, can I reveal the answer? Yes.
about 84% here, Greg. Yeah, I'm just reading the question here. It says, did he say saucerization is shallow cupping? Yes. Very shallow cupping, kind of going very close to the, the edge of the optic nerve, almost like a saucer, if you look at it in profile, as opposed to a serial bone. Is the laminar gel, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking as well, they're answering the question, is the laminar carbosa more anteriorly displaced in that person? Is that is that the cause to the saucerization? Is it I wouldn't say it's nerve? more, I don't think it's more anteriorly dis displaced, it's just, it's less posteriorly displaced. I gotcha. We're up to about 91% voting, Greg, so I'll let you um, reveal. I'm going to hit end. I'm going to share the results and Joe, if I have it right, I can hear your voice saying nothing notches a nerve more than glaucoma. That's right. Notching the neuroretinal rim is very, very specific for glaucoma. Parapapillary atrophy, we don't even know what it means in glaucoma. Actually, there's a series that looked at normal tension glaucoma patients, comparing them to patients with uh, with known compressive tumors, and they actually found optic disc hemorrhage was 100% specific for glaucoma. Not one person with a compressive lesion showed a disc hemorrhage, but by and large, it is optic disc pallor. Pallor in excess of cupping indicates something other than in or, or in addition to glaucoma. That's rule number one of optic nerve. I'm not, I'm not talking about the 95% cup nerve where you're looking at laminar tissue and scleral tissue. I'm talking the 60, 70, or 80% cup nerve where you can actually identify pallor of the neuroretinal rim. If you see that, it's something other than or in addition to glaucoma. Now, like you said, Greg, Nothing notches nerve like glaucoma. Tumors will cause concentric enlargement of the cup. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy will cause concentric enlargement of the cup. But nothing's going to cause a focal notch. Trauma, tumor, aneurysm, nothing will do that. The only thing that really does that is glaucoma. Now, I get asked all the time, do we really need to do visual fields? We have, we have all kinds of tests. We have OCT, we have OCT angiography, we have ganglion cell complex. Nobody likes doing visual fields. They're schedule busters. Patients hate it. We hate it. Technicians hate it. Can we stop doing it? The answer is no. He's a 54-year-old man from Nigeria visiting, uh, visiting this country. Comes and he gets referred to me for glaucoma management. He'd been told he had glaucoma six years earlier uh, in Africa, but underwent no treatment. I don't know why. He has 20-30 vision in the right eye, hand motion vision in the left eye. He was seen in our primary care clinic. And he was told, you've got vision loss from glaucoma. It's not coming back. We need to preserve your right eye vision. His pressure is 30 and 23, right and left eye respectively. Uh, he, was, he was put on a prostaglandin analog, then referred to me in the glaucoma service. When he sees me a few days later, his pressure is now 17 and 15. So the medicine worked nicely. And this is what we see. And he is, he's got about a 0.75, maybe a 0.8 at the most cup to disc ratio. And this is why I like, I like camera. I like the camera. I like photographs so that I can look at things. I can study them. I can put them side by side. And I think we can all see that he's got a pale nerve in the left eye. And yes, I hate to say it, this is often the, the case where I've had colleagues look at this and say, yeah, you've got glaucoma and it's a little pale. And you, well, hopefully you won't say it was from glaucoma because it's not. But this is exactly the kind of case where people will say, yeah, you probably had a stroke in the eye and you had a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy thing. We, we do nothing for it, it just is. And we can't buy that. Now, his nerve fiber layer was done prior to seeing me, and it looks actually really pretty good in the right eye and only moderately damaged in the left, but this nerve and this nerve fiber layer is not a hand motion nerve fiber layer. And yes, glaucoma is a slowly progressive painless disease, but it tends to be more bilateral when, it, when that happens. 
So do we really need new fields in this case? They didn't want to do it in the general care clinic because he didn't speak English very well. They think he'd be a very good, very good field taker. But uh, yeah, we, we have to do visual fields, even, even if we have an OCT. And we can see he's got a classic bitemporal defect Junctional scotoma. He has a pituitary adenoma that is so large, an anteriorly fixed chiasm is actually also compressing the posterior left optic nerve. And that's why his vision was so poor. There's an afferent defect and he lost fixation. So yes, we still need new fields in the age of imaging because it sometimes is not glaucoma. Now, going back to the beginning of the lecture, if my mother-in-law had these fields, I would have behaved differently. Now, sometimes glaucoma can get complicated. He's, she, he's a 70 year old male who has glaucoma. You know, I've diagnosed him, I've been treating him for several years. And he develops an auto accident with, with, with loss, of, loss of consciousness and concussion. And afterwards, he develops gaze induced amaurosis fugax. And he mentions that to his primary care physician and his primary care physician refers him immediately to a neuro-ophthalmologist. And I'm going to explain to you gaze-induced amaurosis fugax. I think we all know about the old term amaurosis fugax is fleeting blindness or temporary loss of vision. Now, gaze-induced amaurosis fugax is strongly suggestive of something in the, in the orbit behind the globe, meaning that when a person looks a certain direction, there's an excursion in the optic nerve. It touches something that doesn't belong there. There's cessation of axial plasmic flow, cessation of blood flow, vision blacks out. Patient looks back in another direction. The optic nerve skirts away. There's re, re, a redevelopment of flow, both blood and axial plasmic flow. The vision comes back. Strongly suggests, suggestive of a retro orbital, uh, retro bulbar mass. Okay goes to the neuro-ophthalmologist, gets a complete evaluation with MRI, looking at just for that, MRI comes back normal. There's nothing behind the globe. There's nothing in the orbit. So the neuro-ophthalmologist decides that this is probably psychological vision loss, which is a very dangerous term. You know, we, we, the, that's a term none of us should be, we shouldn't use the term maling, malingering. Um, we shouldn't use the term hysterical blindness. We shouldn't use the term psychological vision loss because none of us are qualified to make these determinations. Like for example, lingering implies that there should be some potential gain. We don't know this. All we can say is non-organic vision loss. We, we look and we see nothing. Don't call it psychological. We're not psychiatrists. We're not psychologists and we're not social workers. So I don't like using that term. We use the term non-organic vision loss if we can find no cause. I can tell you right now, the patient does not like, hates the neuro-ophthalmologist, does not like being called crazy. He's a type A personality, very sharp, but he does not like being called crazy. He's not, does like being called crazy. So he comes to me and explains the whole situation. And we have to start thinking about what, what comes next. Now, important differences between optometrists and neuro-ophthalmologists. Neuro-ophthalmologists will take a history and neurologists and neuro-ophthalmologists are, are very good at taking histories. Neurologists don't really know the visual system that well. Optometrists know the visual system a lot better than neurologists. And there are a lot of things that we can do that once the patient gets downstream to a neurologist, will never get done again. That's why we should be involved uh, in neuro-ophthalmic patients. But they'll take a history. They'll come up with differential diagnoses. They'll order the tests that they feel are necessary, necessary to support or refute their differential diagnoses. If they find something wrong, they'll refer the patient to the proper medical specialist for treatment. If they find nothing wrong, they'll reappoint the patient for a follow-up, typically six months. They'll telling them to come back if anything gets worse. If nothing, gets, nothing changes after six months, they dismiss the patient. Now we, however, are like philosophers searching for truth. And we feel if we test long enough and order enough tests or do enough things, we'll eventually find the cause 
And we have to acknowledge that doesn't happen in our ophthalmic disease all the time. We have to be able to know when to say when. And the other difference with neurologists and their ophthalmologists is their ability to take a history. You know, their exams are like a, an hour longer, and most of that's by taking history. So we have to go back to the history and, and we have to consider everything. Now here's his optic nerves. We can see that the nerves are very pink and perfused, so he doesn't violate rule number one. And we can see that there is almost no rim tissue there. He's notched up here. He's notched down here. Lots of parapapillary atrophy. He's notched. So he's not pale and he's notched. And we put those two things together, it adds up to glaucoma. So we have to go back to the history. A lot of things we want to ask in the history is, is, is this still happening? If the answer is no, problem solved. But the answer is yes. What do you do that provokes it? How many times does it happen? Are there any additional fi findings or signs that occur or symptoms that occur when it happens? Is there anything that you do to stop it from happening? These are all the simple questions to ask and answer. He tells me it happens to him every day while he shaves. Okay, so I ask him, can you demonstrate? He said, yes. So he got off the chair, marched to the wall, pulled down the, pulled down the mirror, and it took an hour to get that straightened up again. And he starts to mimic shave and he did something like this. He said, yep, right there, I just lost my vision. Now, no, he's not compressing his carotid artery. He's not, because he'd cut his own throat with a razor. We just have to simply look at his nerves. They're not pale and they're notched. They're glaucomatous nerves. And there's his field. And what had happened is when he was shaving, when he turned his head to a certain direction, his nose blocked part of the field that compensated. He looks into his paretic field of gaze and realized he's got field loss. Sometimes it is glaucoma. Now, how do I know this? Very simple. Not pale, notched, and I had normal MRI. We're done. And he was accepting of that. Now he, he, he understood it in the whole concussion and loss of consciousness and automobile act, it was all a red herring. This is a, something that's probably, that was actually happening to him beforehand. He was just more acutely aware of it after his concussion. Now that's a yeah, lot there's of a com oh, yeah, There's a comment in here. It says uh, yes. red cap question mark. Red cap question mark. Uh, red cap is going to be good if there is a significant difference in the apparent system. Now, interestingly, patients with glaucoma or glaucoma, severe glaucoma that may be asymmetric, still don't really pick up a, many changes uh, in, in the red cap. This is usually something that when, when the papillomacular macular, macular uh, bundle is involved. So that is actually a very good test of the afferent, afferent system, which can, which can be done in patients. Can I add to that, Joe? Sure. So I think what the, the, you know, the person's asking too is exactly what you're uh, referencing is, you know, are, is it going to look brown? But I can tell you in this field right here, and I do it all the time with patients, if I would cover, and it's hard for me to say, see, Joe, but it looks like you have the nasal. So your right eye there. Um, if you would cover the patient's left eye and take that red cap and go out temporally and go into that superior temporal quadrant, it would look red and it would look red uh, in the inferior temporal. But if you come over to that nasal quadrant, it's not that we're looking for it to be brown, it's going to disappear or just be, you know, be very, very little red or maybe it does look brown. I understand what you're asking for. Uh, for the person that asked a question, they sent it to me privately, Joe. So I'm not going to reveal the name. Okay. So the uh, the so they're looking for that kind of classic neuro test. But if you go to that nasal side and even go superior to inferior, there, the patient's going to say, "Oh my gosh, I don't see it." And they're going to say, "Yeah, you're lucky that the this glaucoma affects nasally because you do get some crossover. We need to save this other eye so you don't lose that vision." So red cap would be useful, just not in the way traditionally that we're thinking. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be used as almost like a field test. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. And, That's good way and of you. course, and of course, you know, you, you would, with significant asymmetry, you'll have, you'll have uh, an afferent defect. And I also see what I call the, the subjective APD. And what, what do I mean by that is I'm looking in one eye 
and I can, you know, I, I can, I can look with a 90 and the patient is sitting there very quietly, very, very, you know, without any discomfort. And I go to the better eye and they're blinking and they're flinching and, they're, and that's what I call a subjective APD. Now that's a lot of stuff to remember. If you can't remember all I just said, I want you to remember my ode to a cup disc. Oh, to have a cup disc pink that my friend had the glaucoma to stink. But to have a cup disc pale, call this glaucoma you shall fail. Disc and field damage is one side it simply cannot be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember, nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. If you remember that, that'll keep you out of trouble with optic nerve. Case, a 46-year-old male complains of a droopy left eye began about six weeks earlier. He's yeah, we got, have a question, if oh, you don't yes. mind. Yep. Go ahead. It says, how, many, how much asymmetry before you start to see APD? Oh, let's see. And I can answer that from a visual field standpoint. I mean, in a case like this, I think there's enough asymmetry. I would, I would see an, I would see a mild APD here. Yeah, the, the, diff, the, the, the answer out there, if you're doing a Humphrey visual field and like a 24-2, you're going to, what takes a difference between the two eyes is three decibels. Three decibel difference between the eyes will create a, an APD. Now, I do that a lot, and I see a ten and a seven. Obviously, the ten is the damaged eye minus minus ten on the on the mean deviation. And when that happens, if you do uh, an APD APD testing, it's gonna be minimal. All right, when you start getting around, you know, you know, say three and a half or four, you can definitely start picking it up. But the clinical answer out there is three decibel difference. And that's for glaucoma, correct? Yeah, glaucoma, yes. I mean, just that much difference between the visual fields. I'm not sure if it has to be glaucoma. It could be, I know, a branch vein occlusion. Um, and it's going to create I've seen, I've three decibel. Seen, I have seen actually optic neuropathies that have very, very little asymmetry with a market APD. And people want, you know, do, do you grade APDs? You know, there's grade one, two, three, four. And... I think people write it down. It's all very subjective. It's very, very hard to uh, to to, quali to qualify that. I've always, you know, people ask me how to how I used to judge APDs. I said, well, it all depends who sees it. in In my teaching in my teaching clinic, if if I if it were seen by a fourth year student, it, it was a grade one. If it was seen by a third year student, it was it was a grade two. If a second year student saw it, it was a grade three. And if a first year student can find it, it was so obvious as a grade four. That's how I graded them. Yeah, I'll point out too that what I have in my office, and again, for COVID reasons, I have no financial interest, but uh, there's a there's an, actually a, a, an instrument out there by Conan um, that we use in our office. And I've been using it a lot just because um, when you start getting, I've been using it a lot for early glaucoma patients. If they're running, you know, uh, high pressures, um, you know, my APD skills are not good enough to pick up these, you know, point, you know, uh, five neuro density filter. So there's actually a automated, um, pupil, uh, APD, you know, uh, unit out there and it's by Conan. Again, I have no financial interest in it. Just thought I'd point that out. And I love it at the practice, especially when I'm like, eh, let's uh, drop them on the, uh, drop them on the instrument for me. So pretty cool. Well, he's a 46-year-old male, complains of droopy left eye of about six weeks duration. He had noted a headache and some numbness on that side when it all occurred. And he had been treated for, uh, for hives, I think, on the back of his neck. He went to an emergency room where they diagnosed him with a sty and prescribed a non-effective uh, antibiotic. Now... He actually got referred to me by a local optometrist who just happened to run into him in a social situation, found out he was an optometrist, told a story, said it goes to my friend Joe, see what he has to say. Ocular history unremarkable. He had mitral valve prolapse, reflux disease. He had lost 20 pounds that he didn't really have an explanation for over the past six months. He was on a few medicines for a couple of conditions, metoprolol. Uh, for his prolapse, Xanax, prednisone for the uh, hives, Lipitor for cholesterol, Claritin. And I'm not going to go through all this. Suffice it to say he had a left upper lid ptosis, a left meiosis, 
Uh, everything else was pretty uh, unremarkable. He looked like this. And when I see this, it's, it's pretty characteristic. And uh, one of the first things I'm going to think about is a Horner's syndrome. He's got a meiosis and a ptosis. I don't get into sweat. I don't put cornstarch on a patient. But sometimes a patient will say, I, I don't sweat on one side of my face or I'm not sweating. OK, that's enough for me. I'm fine with that. You don't have to have everything if you're thinking Horner syndrome. Now, Horner syndrome is very labor intensive. It, 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 it can be a straightforward diagnosis. There's a lot of work involved. I don't want to embark on this because it can be very expensive unless I'm sure. So I want to make sure that I've got it. And what I want to do is pharmacologic testing. And I use something called iopidine or aproclonidine, half percent. And this works off the, the properties of denervation supersensitivity. Horner syndrome is a disruption of the sympathetic nervous system. The postsynaptic receptors get so starved for norepinephrine that, uh, that a very, very weak amount will cause an exaggerated response. Now, very important, aproclonidine. It's an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, but it also has weak alpha-1 properties. Not vermonidine, not phenylephrine, and I don't know about the new one, Upneak. Uh, I've been told that it should. I don't know. But apraclonidine will actually cause a stimulation. Now it looks like he has a right, right Horner syndrome. This actually will cause a reversal. It's so characteristic. So pre-iopidine, post-iopidine. The lid comes up. The pupil dilates. Nothing happens in this eye. How long does this take? About 10 minutes or so. So he's got a Horner syndrome, but it's not clear what's causing it. Now, headache, neuralgia, and hives. And it's not gonna, it's not a cluster migraine. Uh, it's not zoster, didn't sound right. I didn't like the weight loss. So my approach was, I want you to go to your primary care physician, get a history, get a physical, and then I'll start doing the, uh, the evaluation. How long do I have? It's been there for six weeks. I've got six weeks to figure this out. So this is a triad that disrupts the sympathetic nervous system, causing meiosis, ptosis, and anhydrosis. Now, important to know, not everything has to be there for it to be Horner's syndrome. It can be diagnosed with just one of these findings. But as a three neuron arc begins the dorsal lateral hypothalamus, goes down the, the, the spinal cord, synapses here at about level T1, goes up over the long apex, synapses number two to the superior cervical ganglia, and then it goes to the sweat glands of the face, the smooth muscle of the eyelid, the muscle of Mueller to the radial muscle. One, two, three, a lot of territory in there. So it's like travel. The more connections you have, the more likely your travel is going to be disrupted. Now, pharmacologic tests, when we used to use cocaine, you put it in a Horner's people will do nothing, uh, won't dilate, but a normal people will, will, will dilate. Hydroxyamphetamine used to be used to differentiate the pre from post ganglionic uh, lesions, but it's not available. And it doesn't matter where, where it is, bad stuff happens everywhere. So you just can't look at it and, 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 and try to consider that it might be benign. Bad stuff can happen anywhere along that three neuron arc. Iopidine, apraclonidine, works on denervation supersensitivity, as I just explained. But important to remember, there, uh, there's a lag. You know, it, it takes about 36 to 72 hours for that supersensitivity to set in. So early on, you make it a false negative. Now, there's also something called a dilation lag. You put a patient into a dark room and normal pupil dilates quickly. A Horner syndrome pupil will dilate very slowly. So that is another thing you can do. If you don't have the pharmacology, just put them in a dark room. The only challenge is measuring pupils in the dark. But the anisocori will actually diminish over about five minutes, and that happens relatively rapidly. But apraclonidine, Horner people will dilate, normal people doesn't. Now, bad stuff happens everywhere. Vertebral baths are insufficiency, infarct uh, in the right population, multiple sclerosis, tumor. 
Uh, second order, tumor of the lung apex, as we know, Panko syndrome. Patients who have weakness uh, in the hand and pain in the scapular region, and for smokers, cough, you got to consider the possibility of a Panko's tumor. Third order, headache syndrome, such as cluster migraines, uh, Raiders paratrigeminal syndrome, internal carotid dissection, which I'll talk about in a little bit, earache, so titus media, Tolisa Hunt, there are a number of things. These take a lot of work. It's best to have an idea where to look and what to do. Now, if they have neck and facial pain, you're probably looking at carotid dissection. Facial paresthesias, middle cranial fossil disease. Now, if you don't know, these are people that need three scans. They have to scan from the chest to the head. They need an MRI of the brain orbs and chiasm with and without contrast with attention to the middle cranial fossa, number one. They need a CTA or an MRA, but preferably CTA of the, of the head and neck to rule out a carotid dissection. They need an MRI of the neck and the C-spine, which includes lung apex and brachial plexus. These are three different scans. Now, if you can't remember all that, most imaging centers have a Horner's protocol. You tell them what you're looking for and they'll know what to do. Now, on this patient, he came back after about four weeks and uh, he did not get the physical, so I don't know about the weight loss. Again, that turned out likely to be a red herring. But he came back four weeks, didn't get, get, didn't get hit, see his doctor, so I ordered the test myself. Everything came back negative, and of course, you know, he is you know, still alive today. I've got a suspicion what it is, what, what it was, but I, at this point, I can't prove it. But I suspect he had a carotid dissection. This is a third order Horner syndrome with head pain, eye pain, neck pain, face pain. Um, it, it's painful. The painful horrors and a carotid dissection because in the neck region, the, the, the sympathetic plexus travels with the carotid artery. So anything happening in the carotid artery in the neck is going to be, uh, affect the ocular sympathetics. And this is a linear tear in the vessel wall. And when this tear occurs, you'll get a thrombosis. And that thrombosis can lead to emboli. And the emboli go up the, the cerebral vascular tree and cause a major cerebral vascular accident. This is actually an emergency. Carotid dissection, Horner syndrome is an emergency. These are patients that need to go to the, to the ER. These are people who have a new onset painful Horners. They can be surgical trauma, physical trauma, chiropractic manipulation, whiplash, these are all things that can cause it, but they can happen spontaneously. Now, these are people who are at extreme risk of cerebral vascular accident. 52% will have a hemispheric stroke within six days. Two thirds, if it's going to happen, will be in the first week. Nearly 90% within the first two weeks was going to happen. After, after that, after, after 31 days, they're out of the woods. And these are people that need, they need to be supported, they need to be heparized, anticoagulated, antiplatelated, and the vessel will repair itself. They will, they will heal. So they, they, they don't need neurosurgery, they don't need vascular surgery, they need, they need stroke prevention, and they will actually heal. So people who have suspected carotid dissection should go right to the ER and tell them what you're looking for. So confirm it, it's Horner syndrome, Determine if it's accidental or surgical and get the imaging. If it's been there for less than two weeks, urgently. And of course, we got to image the uh, lung apex. You know, this, uh, this woman was a 73-year-old woman who came in to me. She's one of the first patients in my, uh, in my new practice. And I could hear her checking in. I was, I, I was just behind the front desk. And I thought she's going to be a very difficult patient. That she's going to be, she's going to be petulant. And she, you know, she said, I am not going back to my ophthalmologist. They don't listen to me. And she said she's a highly allergic person. And she had pain and ear blockage on the right side of her face when she was gardening. She thought something got in their eye. She explained that to the other doctors. They treated her with xylit, azacite, antihistamines, hot compresses, cold compresses. Her PCP, I, I give credit, you know, tested her for giant cell, which is negative. And, you know, she was, all this is presumed to be allergies, and, but there's no itching. 
it's unilateral and it's, you know three months later now medically she's hypothyroid and a smoker and you know she, i kept hearing her her say that nobody listens to her so my approach was i'm just going to listen to her i sat there and i let her tell me the whole story and she's talking and talking and talking she's, she's not wearing the mask very well i sat back and said you know because I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I know what this is. I'm saying, I've seen this before. I said, your lid is not swollen. She, she keeps saying her lid is swollen. I said, your lid is not swollen. Your lid is tonic. You've got Horner's syndrome. I looked and she had a smaller pupil. So what do I do? Put apiclonid in and this is what she looks like now. You can't tell, but she's smiling under that mask. Before, frowning. After, smiling. So she had Horner's syndrome. I ordered the I ordered the imaging from the from the from the from the shoulders on up, and that was all negative. And her internist to order from the chest on down uh, for cancer, and that was uh, that was uh, that was negative as well. And my sus suspicion is she actually had an otitis media that caused Horner syndrome. And what do I do with her now? She loves apiclonidine. She loves iapidine. So I prescribe it for her. She uses one drop every two days, fixes, fixes her ketosis. She's very happy with it. Diagnosing Horner's is not sufficient. You have to try to find a cause and never assume that it is benign. She's a 59 year old female who, who she's one of, one of my long-term glaucoma patients and not a good glaucoma patient. She come like once every 12 to 18 months for a pressure check. Then one day she comes in after not being there for quite some time and complains of drooping of her right eye and a smaller pupil for about a month. Notice that about the time she was diagnosed with lung cancer and underwent a lobectomy or, 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 or surgical resection. She also was complaining of scapular pain and weakness in her, in her right hand. And she came to me and said, you know, my doc, I asked my doctors, is this due to my lung cancer or my surgery? They said, no. What do you think? And I said, I think yes. Now, medical history, she had lung cancer, diagnosed and treated pancreatitis, hypertension, and acid reflux. Now, her social history is significant for smoking a pack a day for 45 years and drinks a six pack of beer daily. And that was the conservative estimate. Sometimes she'd, she'd drink uh, an entire case. And she looked like this, and she had ptosis, she had meiosis, and already had her diagnosis. So I don't really know you need to go uh, to go much further than this. I didn't do any pharmacologic testing. She actually had Horner's syndrome from a pan coast. And I think we all learned that early in optometry school is that's the worst thing that we're going to come across. When you think about it, that we as optometrists, when we were studying, we might see something in the eye and they would die if they have lung cancer and they could die from this. And we thought this was the worst thing in the world we're ever going to see. Well, this is actually a lung cancer in the apex of the lung involved in the apical chest wall. Treatments, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. But really the, uh, the survival rate is actually pretty, pretty poor. It's around 30%. So prognosis for these patients is pretty grim. It certainly is an emergency. So this is not where we, I think we need to have the fear of Horner's syndrome. I know when I talk about Horner's syndrome for a live audience, I hear people in the, in the, in the audience murmuring, murmuring lung cancer. And that's, yes, we need to get them in the healthcare system, but there's not a lot that can be done that will affect the outcome. But if it's a painful new onset Horner's and you suspect carotid dissection, you can indeed save their lives. Remember that, get them to the ER. Greg, time for polling question number four. Joe, as I launch that, uh, there's a question in the uh, chat box about why doesn't cocaine dilate a Horner's? Because what happens is cocaine prevents re reuptake of norepinephrine. But in a Horner syndrome, there's no norepinephrine being released. So cocaine doesn't have an effect. But on a good eye, what it'll do is it prevents norepinephrine from being from being broken down. It hangs around and keeps acting and acting and acting and acting. So that's why. Which patient with Horner syndrome should be sent immediately to the ER? An asymptomatic 15-year-old with heterochromia? 
a 69 year old smoker with a cough or a hoarse voice or a 35 year old with neck pain and head pain after receiving a vigorous massage? Okay, we're cranking right along there, Greg. Yep, they're rolling in nicely. Looks like we're caught up on the questions, Joe. Very good. Well, we, we hit 90% voting. We ready to call it, Greg? Let's see, a couple more rolled in here and boom. Share results. Heterochromia in a youngster, Horner syndrome, usually it means it, it, it is congenital or it occurred before the, the first two years of life. So heterochromia is actually a good finding. Smoker with a cough and a hoarse voice, yes, it should go to a physician, but I don't think the ER is the necessary. It's not a wrong place, but it's not an urgency. It's the person who has potential carotid dissection. Now that's a lot of stuff to remember. If you can't remember all that, I remember I owed to Horner's. When the lid is low and the people small, check to see the sweat don't fall. Cocaine is no longer universal. Iopedema will cause reversal. You have to scan head to chest. And remember, CTA is best. Pain and association will surely cause commotion. Send to the ER without correction. Remember, it might be carotid dissection. And if you can remember that, that's all you need to know. Greg, is there anything that has rolled in? Uh, no, you're good. All right. Well, we be we're beginning our initial descent of this flight. Rule, suspect the worst. 63-year-old Indian male, one of my long-term glaucoma patients, has a sudden onset of orbital pain of three days duration. Begins on a Friday, gets worse on a Saturday, really bad on Sunday, and he waits until Monday to walk into my glaucoma service because I'm his eye doctor. He comes in for an emergency glaucoma evaluation. He thinks maybe his glaucoma has gotten much worse. He's diabetic and hypertensive, on Coumadin with a pacemaker. Kind of important parts of the story. He has no vision change, but looks like this. And it just amazes me that his complaint was pain, not the fact that his lid won't lift up or that he sees double if he looks, if he, if he lifts his lid. But we can see a partial ptosis on the right side. The eye looks a bit down and out. If we lift his eyelid, he can't look up. He can't look down. He cannot adduct his eye, but he can abduct his eye. So superior rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, medial rectus are all not working. Levator is not working. Abductions is working. Trochlea is probably working. The next thing we want to take a look at is what are his pupils. His left pupil is about two millimeters and briskly responsive. His right pupil is five millimeters unresponsive to light or accommodation. So he's got a fixed dilated pupil with ptosis and clearly a third nerve paresis. And the most likely cause is compression. The most likely cause of compression is intracranial aneurysm. So he's got a pupil involved third nerve palsy of three days duration at least most likely caused with intracranial aneurysm. The exam was the, the exam was 10 minutes. I was done in 10 minutes. So I walk in, I look at him, I knew exactly what he had. Check his pupil, took the pictures, spent the rest of the exam explaining this to the patient and his wife. I actually offered an ambulance. They, they chose not to, but his wife said she would take him right to the emergency room. I wrote down on a, you know, on a, on a pad, patient has a right Pupil involved third nerve palsy, suspect posterior communicating artery aneurysm, needs to see neurosurgeon uh, stat. And I explained to him that, you know, he, this is, the, you know, this is an emergency. And as I explain it, I can see his wife becoming somewhat anxious and 
she asked me, I knew she asked the question I knew she was going to ask. She she asked me, how much is this all going to cost? We don't have insurance. And my response was, it doesn't matter. He's going to die. You don't walk it off. It doesn't get better. If he goes home, he's going to lay down. He's going to become comatose and it'll be too late. And that was impactful. They, they turned down an ambulance ride. You're not wrong to send the patient in an ambulance because if an aneurysm does rupture, that's the best place to, to stabilize the patient. Also, people who come in on a gurney get treated differently than if they walk in on their own power. But I will say that 45 minutes after they left, I got a call on my cell phone from his wife. He was already in a CT scanner. Now, why was he in a CT scanner? Number one, it's the best. CT angiography is the best for this disease. Two, he has a pacemaker. He can't get an MRI. He was actually admitted for 23 days to tell you how sick he was. He underwent two neurosurgical procedures where they packed coils into the aneurysm uh, and he did live. And this is how he looks now. He actually has secondary aberrant regeneration. His ptosis is pretty much resolved. His motility hasn't come back. And as he looks down, there's an aberrant regeneration. Fibers actually go to the medial rectus and inferior rectus also go to the levator. So as he looks down, the levator is also being pulled up. This will never happen in diabetes, only from trauma, tumor, or aneurysm. I can say right now, if you walked into anybody's office and didn't share with this history, you would panic because he's got a slight ptosis. He cannot adduct the eye, can't elevate the eye, can't depress the eye. He's got a fixed dilated pupil. He's got a third, but he has been treated. He's been treated as well as he can be treated. So this is an eye that's down and out with ptosis. There can be adduction, elevation, depression, deficits, and patients can be isochoric or anisochoric, and that's actually very important. Here is an example of a patient. He is an elder, very elderly male who, believe it or not, has ptosis, and it's kind of hard to separate the ptosis from the dermatochelasis. And he was a poorly controlled diabetic, and I think his blood sugars were in the 300s, and his hemoglobin was around 11. And I actually saw him on, on the follow-up. Uh, I wasn't on the floor when he was brought in the first time. He's got a complete ptosis. He can't look up, can't look down. He can't uh, adduct his eye. and His pupils are, are, are symmetrical and briskly reactive. And he did get imaged, but he got imaged through his primary care physician. Now, as I said earlier, best neuroradiologist in the world can't help you if you don't order the scan or the right scan and tell them what to look for. The clinicians went, who were involved initially went through the patient's primary care physician. And I can imagine on the phone probably overwhelmed the internist with all kinds of talk about aneurysms and probably at one point said, but he's badly, his diabetes is badly controlled, it's probably ischemic. Well, that's what the internist heard. So when I actually saw the report, indica indication for imaging was brain ischemia. Not intracranial aneurysm, but brain ischemia ordered through the internist. Again, they're not going to get it right if you don't tell them what to look for. Fortunately, this was ischemic. Now, the pupil motor fibers are coating the third nerve, so they're very vulnerable to compression. So something from the outside such as an aneurysm typically the posterior communicating artery though it can be at the at the juncture with the internal carotid artery at the tip of the basilar is going to touch those pupillar motor fibers and really knock them out and knock out the motility and the lid here's something to remember aneurysms don't cause isolated dilated pupils that doesn't happen An isolated dilated pupil is trauma it's a ganglionic lesion, it's pharmacologic, it's not an aneurysm. You always have lid and motility deficits. Now, an ischemic infarct from hypertension or diabetes will, will impact the vasovasorum going to the core of the nerve. The nerve doesn't work, but due to a rich anastomotic bloodshed uh, communication, the pupil motor fibers are gonna be still nourished, so they're still gonna work. 
Now anatomy is actually very important here because the vessel, the, the posterior communicating artery runs parallel to the third nerve in subarachnoid space. In patients who have a fair distance between the vessel and the nerve, it's going to take a pretty large aneurysm to cause compression. Caveat. If the vessel and the nerve are very close to one another, a very small aneurysm can cause compression, but it may be missed on neuroimaging. A pupil involved third nerve is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm until proven otherwise. Now, an incomplete palsy is also an aneurysm until proven otherwise, regardless of the pupil. What do I mean by that? Here's a patient with a partial third or incomplete third. Lumatosis can't really look all the way up, but can look up a little bit, can look down a little bit. This is, should be considered an aneurysm as well. As aneurysms expand, they will cause the development of symptoms. The pupil may actually be normal initially, but it becomes involved later. So a partial, a new onset partial nerve, third nerve palsy is also an aneurysm, which is probably just developing. 30% of third nerve palsies are going to be caused by aneurysm. Now, I want to qualify that. I'm not telling you there's a one in three chance whenever you see a third nerve palsy, that's an aneurysm. It's not what I'm saying. There are some patients with certain characteristics where you look at it, you realize their risk of aneurysm is probably less than 5%. And another patient, based upon the findings, their risk is probably 90%. Overall, 30% are caused by aneurysm, but does that mean there's a 30% chance that your patient will have an aneurysm? It could be much more or even less. And pain is pain. Can't qualify pain. You know, we used to, you, we used to, or we sometimes would think <coughs> that patients who have aneurysms will have a debilitating hemicranial thunderclap type of pain. Not true. Case in point, Temple University football player develops third nerve palsy, a little bit of headache, aneurysm. Little old lady, worst head pain of her life, diabetes. Pain is only helpful when it's not there. Aneurysms are painful 90% of the time. Or I'm sorry, 100% of the time. And let me, me cross. Aneurysms are always painful. Ischemic palsies are painful 90% of the time. So pain is only helpful if it's not there. If it's vascular pathic, it's going to resolve in time, but aneurysms will, will actually rupture in time, usually within 90, with, with, within 90 days. Now, why am I stressing this? 20% will die within 40 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. Aneurysm ruptures, blood fills a cranial vault, there's only so much room there, brainstem herniates down through frame and magnum, respiratory collapse, death. 20% will die within 40 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. 50% will die overall. Half the patients will not survive this disease. Average time from onset to rupture is within 30 days. 80% will rupture within 30 days. I said 90 should be 30 days. Many patients don't make it to the hospital. Now, ruptured aneurysms have about a 5% surgical mortality rate, and they're going to have some functional impairment postoperatively, major stroke. If the, if the aneurysms are not ruptured, there's virtually no mortality. Three quarters are going to have a pretty good outcome surgically, and about half will actually recover third nerve palsy, uh, third nerve uh, function. Now, how are these uh, how are these these taken care of? Two ways. One is intracranial aneurysm clip. They actually go in through a, with a craniotomy and put a, a clip on on the aneurysm like a like a clip on a bag of potato chips. Now, the other way to go about this is through uh, 
endovascular therapy. They'll go through the femoral artery with a catheter. They'll snake it all the way up through to the to the aneurysm. They'll often put a stent in here, just like on a, on a cardiac vessel to keep the vessel open and squeeze these coils up and pack them in there so the blood can't get in and can't rupture. They'll usually leave a stent in there if necessary. Now, I, I've often said that these are, these are both equally effective procedures and they're both relatively simple for a skilled neurosurgeon. And I, I guess I have to uh, I have to rethink that and qualify that. I actually had a retired neurosurgeon for a pa pain, uh, patient uh, about a week or about two weeks ago. We came in with an emergency, and I was talking to her about it, and she said, "No, it's got you kind of hard." <laughs> so I always said this is really simple for a skilled neurosurgeon. She said, "No, it's really pretty hard." So you, you open the door and it, it's been bleeding. It's, it's all sopping with blood. And, and then if it pops, now, now you've got a huge mess on your hand. So I, and she said, we really don't do these very often. And he said, most, she says, most everything is done endovascular at this point. But aneurysm clips are, are still being used occasionally. Here's a rule. Never dilate a, per, a patient with third nerve palsy. This, this is a rule that's violated in every person, in, I'm sorry, in, in every optometry and every ophthalmology training program, residency program across the country every year. Um, I know that uh, Bill, one of my, one of my co-residents at PCO is, 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 uh, is on this webinar. And I, I think he, you know, he, he even remembers how, how that got violated one time during, during our residency. It always happens. The reason is somebody's gonna need to look at the pupil. And by botching up that, that pupil with a, with a pharmacologic dilation, it takes away some important information. So look at whether you're undilated 90, direct ophthalmoscope, optos unit, claris unit, non midriatic fountain fundus camera. Take a look back there so you have the information, but don't dilate them. Now, rules for for imaging third nerve palsy. If, if there's a high suspicion of an aneurysm, you know, digital subtraction arteriography is gonna be the gold standard. That's what they're gonna do in the ER. Now, CT and CTA is a preferred non-invasive for third nerve palsy, because CT is very good for looking for blood back there. And CT angiography is very sophisticated in finding the, uh, the, the abnormality. Now, CT angiography requires contrast, so if they're renally impaired, MRI or MRI might be uh, an option. CTA is better if they uh, if they can't have an MRI, so this is claustrophobic, they have a pacemaker. An MRI can be superior if it turns out not to be an aneurysm, but maybe a sarcoid granule or a tumor. And MRI, MRI adds very little time to the scan. I can tell you right now, people who deal with this We'll say today in 2020, every third nerve palsy will get will get an end. We'll, we'll get imaging. Now, it's important to order the right thing. You have to have an MRA or a CTA if you're looking for an aneurysm. So you're looking for an or if you or whomever you're just you're consulting with or helping out the ER physician if you're helping them out, let them know what to look for and how to do it. A, to find an A aneurysm, you need an A, CTA or MRA. Remember, there's no A in MRI. And you need an A to find an A. And they actually will show pretty well, you know, the, the abnormalities. I've always said that if you order these tests yourself, always pay the extra money and get the images that come with arrows because they're much easier to interpret. Here's a different patient with a different prognosis, a 63-year-old female, diabetic and hypertensive, not well controlled, who has a sudden onset retroorbital pain. This is what always I find remarkable. It's the pain factor. Not the fact that she can't lift up her eyelid or if she lifts up her eyelid, she sees double. That's not the complaint. The complaint's always pain. But we lift up, she can't look up, she can't look down, she can AD duct, cannot, she can not AD duct, but she can AB duct, and in primary, she's down and out. So this is a complete third nerve pause with pupil sparing, older person, vascopathic risk factors, 
this is not a 30% chance of aneurysm, it's much less. So which is better, one or two? Resolved over several weeks without complications. Hospitalized 23 days, two neurosurgical procedures, but he did live. Always suspect the worst. I was talking about this out west one time. I think it might have I think it might have been Wyoming or Montana. And what I thought, you know, a very brave optometrist in the audience got up and said that they had they had seen a, a patient with a third nerve palsy in their practice. I don't recall what the status of the pupil was, but their plan was referred to ophthalmology the next day. The patient had an aneurysm, it ruptured. And the patient died overnight from a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the presence of vasculopathic risk factors help. Well, arteriosclerotic risk factors in an older person does favor a microvascular etiology, but it doesn't protect from an aneurysm because diabetes, hypertension, smoking, atherosclerosis, these are all common. They don't protect for, against an aneurysm. So the answer is no, but it makes me real nervous when they're not there. Does the acuteness of presentation help? You know, kind of yes, kind of no. Aneurysm expansion usually produces uh, acute manifestations, but chronic and evolving cases are well known and reported. So acute is worrisome, but that can also be ischemic. Chronic and proven is less worrisome, but it doesn't rule out an aneurysm. Resolved without recurrence, that's the best. So what is a threat assessment? of an isolated third nerve palsy for an aneurysm. An isolated dilated pupil, no lid or no motility abnormality, there's no risk. Okay, there's no risk. That's not an aneurysm. A complete third nerve palsy, complete, with normal pupil, older person, vasculopathic risk factors, low risk. A partial third with a normal pupil is a high risk because that's probably a developing aneurysm and a pupil involved third is one of the only true emergencies that we're going to see in eye care. You're never out of the woods. Patient had a third nerve palsy from aneurysm. We talked about aneurysm clips versus coils. Now all those coils were in their, in their MRI safe, but not all aneurysm clips were, were MRI approved. Patient underwent uh, an MRI with a non-approved clip because the radiologic tech didn't verify what type of clip they had. The clip moved during the MRI. Patient had a fatal hemorrhage during the procedure. Survived the disease, killed by the follow-up. Greg, that brings me to polling question number five. Which patient should immediately be sent to the ER? A 69-year-old hypertensive diabetic woman with a complete painless third nerve palsy normal pupil. A 50-year-old with painful partial third nerve palsy and normal pupils. A 60-year-old with a painful complete third nerve palsy and a dilated pupil. going pretty quickly on this one actually, Greg. Yeah, doing well. Would it be okay to advise a patient to see if pupil dilates later on? Would it be okay to advise patient to see if pupil dilates later on? Oh, yeah, yes. And here's something I'm going to throw out to you. I, I have to remember this more myself when it comes to triage. Text me a picture. Yeah, best thing, text me. I, I tell patients all the time when I'm on call, text me, text me a picture. So the answer is Let's yes. Look at that. Look at that. We got um, way above up into the 90s. That's awesome. Thanks, yep. everyone. Joe, I'm going to share it.
Yeah, 60 year old with a painful complete third impulse and a di the dilated pupil is, is absolutely an emergency. That that that's an aneurysm until proven otherwise. A 50 year old with a partial third that's painful and a normal pupil, yeah, that could be a, an aneurysm growing. And a 69 year old diabetic with complete painless third nerve palsy in normal pupils, is that an emergency? The answer is no. But is it wrong to send it? Well. Let's say, I'm going to say no, it's not wrong to send it, but make sure the right thing gets done. If you can't get the, and don't send it to ophthalmology, they don't want to see this. Neuro-ophthalmology, if you can sit, get that patient seen by neuro-ophthalmology within a day or two, that's certainly fine. If you don't think you can do that, ER is one of the safest places to be. I mean, maybe not during COVID, but it's one of the best places to be. You can send them and say, look, I think this is going to be back. This is going to be normal. I want you to get a CT, CT, have them do these tests. Is it an emergency? No, it's probably going to end well. But you've not done wrong to send that patient either. But this one you absolutely have to send. And we're just about to touch down, Greg. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up with my O to a third because that's a lot of stuff to remember. If you can't remember that, I want you to remember my O to a third. When the eye is down and out with ptosis, you better hope for meiosis. If the palsy is total with pupil sparing, in an oldie, it's vascular and not too daring. A partial palsy calls for double duty. It's probably an aneurysm going through puberty. But if the pupil is dilated, an aneurysm is violated. No time for a deferral and no time for a referral. Send to the ER without debate. Remember, 20% will die in the first 48. And that's all you need to know. If you remember that, they'll keep you out of trouble with third nerve palsies. And Greg, I think we've touched down. We have arrived on time. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, um, all the questions have been asked. Uh, there was one about pupil sparing, but you touched on it. So um, oh, I think we're good. Terrific. I'm going to have you stop sharing there. Uh, we got the roll rolling in saying great job. I'm going to jump in here and just share this, do some housekeeping here, everyone. So let me share this. Let me share that one. Okay, so I want to thank everyone here for uh, taking uh, discussions in neuro-ophthalmic disease rules, exceptions to the rules, and exceptions to the exceptions to the rules. Joe, you did a great job tonight. A um, couple of times I've heard this, and every time I hear it, I keep learning something new. So, uh, um, you know, repetition is good for me certainly. And uh, it was a pleasure here to, to thank uh, pleasure here to host this tonight. So I want to thank everyone. And Vanessa, thank you for being on as co-administrator and administrator of the meeting tonight.